just some words that Susie just sang. If you're ready, you can shake the world. Believe again, it starts within. We don't have to wait for destiny. We can be the change we want to see. Isn't that beautiful? That's a good time. That's a good time. Ooh, it's Easter. Don't you really appreciate Barbara's enthusiasm about Easter? I don't share it. Don't get me wrong. For the first part of my life, first 30 years, I was a Christian. Sometimes a good Christian, sometimes a bad Christian, but I always identified as Christian. That was, that was uh, pretty easy early on. That's what I was trained in as a child. And uh, then I started really kind of looking at it. And it wasn't, it's not that I'm somehow saying there's wrongness here. There's no wrongness. In fact, it, it all fits together very nicely. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. But it wasn't working for me in, in the literal sense of how it was being presented. And I think the thing that, that captured my understanding of that or my, my, my whole revisiting of that was just the whole idea that when I heard that the Gospels were written, you know, something between 60 and 100 years after Jesus lived. And it just, it just said, wait a minute, something there. I, I think that Jesus must have been an incredible avatar, must have been an extraordinary teacher, or, or this thing would not have, have uh, appeared in the world the way it has. But the idea that, the, that the, the Gospels are literal fact about the life of Jesus, nothing supports that. So I thought I'd give us an example of that. A hundred years, how life changes over a hundred years. Anybody around a hundred years ago here? <laughs> Yeah, almost. You think so, huh? I have some, some information about what life was like in this country a hundred years ago, and I'm using this to create a context. I'm going to read you some information. There's going to be some pictures if you want to watch them up on the screen. But just be with this for a moment, okay? A hundred years ago, only 14% of the homes in the United States had bathrooms. 8% had telephones. There were only 8,000 cars in the United States and only 144 miles of paved roads. 144 <laughs> miles of paved roads. The maximum speed in most cities was 10 miles an hour. <laughs> Alabama, Mississippi, Iowa, and Tennessee were more populated than California. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> The average wage in the United States was 22 cents an hour. 22 cents an hour. The average work week in America was 12 hour days, six days a week. About half of the states had some sort of restrictions on child labor. This is the kind of restriction they had, that a child could not work more than 10 hours a day. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution establishing a federal income tax had just been ratified. So, if you made less than $20,000, and think about 22 cents an hour average wage, if you made more than, or less than $20,000 per year, your income tax was 1%. There was no social security. There was no unemployment insurance. There was no support of any kind for seniors or anyone who was disabled. More than 95% of all births in the United States took place in people's homes. Yay! 90% 90% of all doctors had no college education. Sugar cost four cents a pound. Eggs were 14 cents a dozen. Coffee was 15 cents a pound. There was no Starbucks. <laughs> Most women wash their hair once a month. And used, used to wash their hair, they used borax or egg yolks. Most people bathe no more than once a week. 6% of all Americans had, had graduated from high school. 6% had graduated from high school. Marijuana, heroin, and morphine were available over the counter at every drugstore. <laughs> 
There were about 230 reported murders in the United States in, uh, in, two, in 1914. Women were not allowed to vote. African Americans were barred from holding union jobs. And the average life expectancy in this country was 47 years. Anybody here remember any of that? <laughs> Times change. Things change. Life changes. Oh, you didn't move this very quickly, did you? <laughs> we were way past that. What happened? I don't care. Just go through them, okay? That's enough of that. So the idea of that, the idea of this is that life really changes. Now, did, did life change uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean as rapidly as it did in the United States over a period of 100 years? Probably not, but it changed. It changed. Those people that wrote those things called the Gospels, they never met Jesus. They probably never met anyone who met Jesus. They were generations later. And the way Aramaic was, was uh, the language of, of Aramaic was an oral tradition. They, there was no, no written language in Aramaic. So it took different people living up to 100 years later after Jesus' life to write down in Greek these ideas that were surrounding the life of, of Yeshua uh, the Nazarene. Many of the facts that are presented were irrelevant because that didn't matter to them. It didn't, it wasn't being factual was not important. That wasn't part of the tradition. It was making a point. It was, it was sharing something interesting. The idea of, of magic and uh, uh, all kinds of supernatural things was generally accepted by people in those days as, as a natural occurrence in life. So the things that people would read now put back almost 2,000 years ago just don't, don't relate. We cannot possibly know what life was like in Palestine 2,000 years ago. That's, that's, not, that's not reasonable at any level. Even historians have, have struggled with the idea of what was, what was going on. But there is something there. There's still something there. Or there wouldn't be this, this massive church, this thing called uh, the Christian faith. It wouldn't exist if there wasn't something there. So I've done some research and I looked into what it was that at least scholars nowadays believe that caught this thing on fire and made it work. Because it didn't match the times. There were tumultuous times, terrible times, wars and rebellions, and uh, especially in Palestine and, and in uh, Galilee, all the time, people, people going to war, and guerrilla fighting, and, and, and then the Romans would come in and just level cities and, and take all the people into slavery or kill them all. It was just an incredibly different kind of human experience than we could even possibly imagine. So why would this thing called Christianity, based on the life of Yeshua of Nazareth, why would it catch on in the world? There's some interesting ideas around that. One is, can you hear my notes so I do this right? Yeah. One is that the, the early Christian message promised for the first time immortality. That had never been a concept in the human experience, at least in that part of the world. The idea that uh, uh, the idea of, of reincarnation, perhaps. I mean, there's in, there, there is evidence that the Jewish faith had some sense of reincarnation because they would only uh, name children after dead relatives. So there was some sense that that might have been accepted, but the idea of living an eternal life, of having immortality, was not a generally accepted idea until the Christian movement came along. And the idea that that was embraced by people gave them something to look forward to in the next life. You know, in that, play, in that idea that there's something beyond this that where I don't have all the sickness and the poverty and the problems that I have, that I'm just going to live in a state of bliss indefinitely, forever and ever. People like that idea. So that caught on. Another idea that caught on very, very quickly was the idea of having a relationship with something greater than themselves. Because that had never been allowed. You know, at that particular time, most of that part of the world was part of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire uh, had a very strict hierarchy. The emperor was at the top. And from that position, the emperor could decide what blessings were bestowed upon the people or what punishment. Completely controlled in that hierarchy. 
But this was different. This was the idea that you could have a relationship with something greater than what you could see, something divine perhaps, beyond that, that uh, very limited relationship that you had inside this Roman hierarchy. I, I find it interesting, and this probably is a shot, but I'll do it quickly. Uh, the, that, the, uh, uh, that the Roman Empire structure and the structure of the Roman Catholic Church are very similar. <laughs> you know, you take out, take out all the, you know, the idea of punishment, that, but well, maybe that's there too. But, the, you know, it's just very similar. And hierarchies tend to be that way, where this was the idea that you could, you could really have this personal relationship with God. Let's just say it. That was new. That was different. And people were interested. The other thing that was pointed out was that, that one of the key elements of the early Christian movement was this commandment to love. To love. To love. And the people that joined in this movement took that very seriously and realized that it was their responsibility to support the people in their community. You know, the story, the story in the Bible of the, the Samaritan. Samaria, Samaritan. Samaria is actually right south of, of Galilee. And it was the, the people in Galilee and the people in Samaria didn't get along. So the idea that there was somebody that could actually be so generous was breaking down the boundaries of how you would see people outside of your own group and how you could be loving to people that didn't see it exactly the same way. Now, I know that some Christian sects have kind of lost that, that sense of, of reaching out and going beyond their borders. But the idea is, is that there, you know, if, if you, all of us or all of all the people at any Christian church were suddenly to be in the same room mixing, we couldn't tell the difference. There wouldn't be any difference. We are, we're all these people on planet Earth trying to find our way. But this early church gave people a new way of doing it. And although all the structure and hierarchy showed back up um, in many different ways over the years, over the, the uh, centuries, Still, those early elements is what likely provided the church with the opportunity to grow and succeed. It really wasn't about a religion. It was about being a part of something. So what a wonderful idea. So I wonder, in our lives today, how does this apply? How, what can we learn from that early church? We are approaching our first hundred years as a, as a spiritual movement. Yeah. So we're getting to that place where we can start seeing the values that were present in the first, uh, at a hundred years old in the Christian church. It's a different way of being in the world. Are we growing? Are we taking advantage of that? Well, I think we can. And place blessings upon, upon every Christian community around the world as they celebrate an Easter of a risen Savior. God bless them. That's wonderful. What works for me is to continue to perceive life in a greater way, to continue to evolve in my understanding of the divine. That's what I want to do. So I, I'm not going to be held by edicts of 2,000 years ago. Instead, I'm going to move into a greater understanding of who I am. I cannot understand the Yeshua of 2,000 years ago. It's not my job to do that. My job is to know who I am. My job is to live in a greater understanding of myself. But we take the lessons of that early church. Immortality. I believe that life is eternal. I believe that all of us do not begin at the time that our bodies are born. And we do not cease to exist at the moment that we take our last breath. I think that is simply a segment of our infinite experience of life. Who knows how we do it? Do we reincarnate into other bodies on this planet? Maybe. Do we go somewhere else in the universe? Do we go to other universes? I don't know. And right now I don't care. Right now I'm here. And that's where I want to, want to be. And that's where I'm going to focus my attention. All of that's going to happen soon enough. For all of us. You're all going to die. <laughs> but you're not going to cease to exist. You're just going to drop your body, right? That's what we do. That's how it works. Today, we're here in bodies. We might as well take full advantage of that. We might as well take full advantage of being these immortal beings living this human physical experience by remembering who we are and not getting caught in the momentary challenges of life because we all have them. We all have something that we're working on. But the truth is, is that he, no matter what happens in this existence, we continue to exist. 
So I think we've got this immortality thing down. The second one was relationship to something greater. Well, Holmes' most famous uh, phrase of all was, there's a power for good in the universe, and you can use it. He said that every time he did a TV show or radio show, and many of his lectures started with that phrase. There's a power for good in the universe, and you can use it. Well, what he was saying is that the universe is this powerful presence, and you're in the midst of it. And you really can't not use it. Every time you have a thought, you're using it. So pay attention to your thoughts because they're creating your experience. Holmes said that we, we impress upon the law, upon the medium of life, upon that which is the creative essence. We impress with our thought upon it, and then it re reveals to us that reality into our experience. <coughs> wow. That's amazing. What a wonderful place to be. What a wonderful way to, re to have a relationship with life. Because what we put out comes back to us. It's elegant. It's beautiful. It's mystical. And that's what we teach. And that's where, how we practice our lives. Does that mean we never have challenges? Of course not. We create our challenges. We do. And we learn from them. And even if our challenges take us to a place that we swear we don't want to be, there's something there for us every single time. So I'm certain that our work in creating a relationship with something greater than us is fully present in who we are in this movement as we study and practice the science of mind. And the final of these was love. Love, the great commandment. Love one another. I think we're doing pretty good with that. I think when we come together as community, we provide an opportunity to open ourselves up to one another. I know when someone in this community struggles with something, many people come to them, not to fix them because they're not broken. They're simply struggling. It's a choice. But we have those that lift us up. And that's all of our jobs, not just practitioners. It's all of our jobs to lift, our, lift ourselves up. And many of you know that you're really good at that, that you don't hold on to something that holds somebody down, that, that sees somebody down. That when you see them doing that to themselves, you go, that's not the truth. They're the presence of the divine. They're living an elegant, beautiful, wonderful life. And if they've forgotten that for the moment, they're remembering it. It's coming, it never left, it didn't go away. And because of that, we get to create a life that works for all of us. This is our gift to the world. We're only in 100 years. How many communities existed 100 years after the time of Christ that called themselves Christian? I would guarantee you less then there are science of mind centers in the world right now. So where are we going to be in another 100 years or 200 years or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years? Will this be the way the world sees itself? Will, will the world of people living on planet Earth say, I create my experience? Will all of them say that? My guess is yes. So don't underestimate this thing that we do just because there are all these Christian churches around us, and there's only us right here, right now, in Western North Carolina, that doesn't mean that we're any less important. We are doing our work. And whether every Christian church in the world embraces the, the teachings that I've just talked to you about, or rejects them, it doesn't matter. Everybody is finding their way to a higher understanding of the presence of the divine. That includes me, and that includes you. So it's Easter, a high holy day of the Christian church. We celebrated with children out finding goodies in the gardens. We celebrated by knowing who we are, being proud of who we are in this teaching called the science of mind. And those of you that may don't, don't, maybe don't know much about that, we encourage you to keep coming to classes and on Sundays. We're going to keep talking about it because this is our intention is to create this world where we are all lifted up into our fullest expression. This is who we are. Happy Easter. Thank you. <laughs>